Uh, if I haven't met you guys, my name is John, and I've had the, the thrill of a lifetime to get to start this church along with a whole bunch of people, my wife and my brother and Tommy and our friends, and man, this is just an incredible day for so many of us, and I know for you, and so thank you guys for coming here today. Uh, if you're brand new and you're visiting, thank you for taking a risk to come to church in a former Lazy Boy outlet. Uh, we know the chairs are comfortable. They're not as comfortable as they once were, uh, certainly, but thank you guys for coming here today. It means a lot that you'd come and you'd celebrate with us. So thank you so much. Uh, it was a couple weeks ago, I was walking around and with my dog, Jack, and I'm a country boy at heart. And so the way I connect with Jesus, it's not in a chair. Uh, it's out walking around in nature and with my dog. <laughs> and so I was thinking about this message. You know, it's, it's kind of a big one, I guess. You know, our grand opening sermon that I'm going to give. And uh, I had a pretty clear thought on the direction I was going to go. And I just felt God directing me in another direction. And I've done this long enough to know that I should go in his direction. So I'm going to go in his direction. And what God did on my walk with Jack is remind me of an epic story. It's a grand opening of sorts in the Old Testament. And the Bible, if you've ever picked one up or read it, it's, it's made up in two kind of big sections. The, the Old Testament, old school, and then the New Testament, new school. All right, so I highly recommend you read it. Uh, it's really powerful. It's an amazing book. And in the Old Testament, there's all kinds of great stories. I'm such a story guy. I think a lot of us are. And so there's this one story of the, the people of God, the nation of Israel. And they'd been on this amazing journey. There's this guy named Moses. Maybe you've heard of him before, Charlton Heston. Uh, maybe you've seen the movie. And, uh, but he's actually a real person in the Bible. And he's leading God's people out of slavery. And he does. And they go into the wilderness. And all kinds of things are happening. And eventually, Moses comes to the end of his run. And he hands the baton over to his understudy, to his protege named Joshua. And the vision had always been to lead people, God's people, into the promised land. Into this land that would, like metaphorically, flow like milk and honey and gummy bears and just amazing streams of chocolate, right? This is kind of what I vision, at least, Willy Wonka style. And so God's vision for his people in the Old Testament is that they would be led into the promised land. And, and so Moses hands the baton over to Joshua. And Joshua, in the book of Joshua, is a story that I want to talk to you about. It's a story of a city named Jericho. In fact, it was the first, not the final, but the first battle that they would fight, and their victory came in such an unexpected way. And as God was reminding me of the story of Jericho, it was in their story that I saw our story. Over the past seven and a half years of starting this church and being in this community with you, we've seen many things that they saw on that day. And so I want to read you a few verses from there and make some observations. If you have a Bible, you can open up to Joshua chapter 6. Uh, if you haven't seen it since the 80s, this is like no judgment zone, all right? I'll pull it up on the screen for you. Let me read this to you. Joshua chapter 6, we'll start in verse 1. Now, the gates of Jericho, everyone say Jericho. Jericho. Yeah, Jericho, were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with all its king and its fighting men. So remember that, kind of mentally highlight fighting men. Verse 3, march around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them, sound a long blast on the trumpets. Have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up. Everyone straight in. I recommend you read the entirety of the story in your own time this week, but I'll kind of cut to the chase. A little bit of a spoiler alert. It happens. They do exactly as God says, and the walls come tumbling down. Three observations I think are very relevant for us on this monumental day. The first, I'll start there in verse one. God says to Joshua, see, I have, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men, March. All right, so as I'm reading this and I'm studying this, I'm like, well, well which one is it? Because God, when you say I have, that sounds like it's done. God, when you say I have, that's, that's the past tense. What's this March thing have to do with anything? You just said it's done. You just said it's completed. It's taken care of. God, I mean, I have. I have handed this to you. Like it is a, a battle that has already been won. Why do I have to march? Like when God says, I have, I'm thinking, I'm going to put my feet up. 
This is a perfect opportunity to put my feet up, pour a glass of iced tea or something, right? We're going to relax. I mean, we're going to take a break. We're going to get a nap in. I love naps. I'm not the only, I mean, naps are very close to godliness. Like, we're going to relax. We're going to take it easy. God says that it's already been taken care of, but then he says march. So God, what's going on here? Here's what's going on here. We participate in the promise. We, you, I, participate in the promise. We participate in the promise. It was two weeks ago, we had an open house for Mission Legacy. If you're 50 and older, we believe that God has the most extraordinary things in the second half of your life. Those that are clapping, I think, are part of Mission Legacy. We started this community a year and a half ago because there are like thousands and thousands of people in the second half of their life in the 10. And we want them to know that as long as you have oxygen in your lungs, you're not done. You're not done until you're dead. And so we want to help you get on mission. We want you to kind of give back all that experience, all that wisdom, all of the things that you've learned in your life. And so we have this community called Mission Legacy. In fact, this Thursday night, they kick off. It's going to be a great night. But two weeks ago, we had the open house. And it was a chili cook-off because you connect with God when chili is involved. And so we did a chili cook-off, and I'm at my house, and I'm getting ready to come to help set up and get ready for it. And so I'm getting ready, putting my shoes on. And my youngest daughter, Hallie, she says, Dad, I'm coming with you. And I said, well, no, you're not, because we have, you have school tomorrow. Uh, she says, no, no, Dad, I'm actually coming with you. And so maybe this is bad parenting, but with her, I'm always evaluating, is this a hill I'm going to die on? And she's really persuasive, right? So I'm like, yeah, you're coming with me. All right, so I just said, Kelly, she's coming with me. I'll have her home by midnight. It's going to be great. <laughs> and so we get in the car. We drive here, and I know that there's a lot of work to be done. we got to get set up. There's all kinds of chairs that we have to set up. And I just want to ask you the question, do you think I actually needed Hallie's help, yes or no? The answer is no, because she's seven. But we had all of these chairs that needed to set up, and so as a good father, I just said, listen, Hallie, I want you to be part of this. And so Hallie starts setting up these chairs. I mean, look at her. I mean, she brought her cowboy boots. She's ready to do some work, right? And she's setting up chairs, and she's part of it. The truth is, I could have done it without her. But any good father wants their child to be in the middle of it all once it actually happens. And so it was about an hour after that, we get everything set up, all kinds of people start pouring in, and here's Hallie, my seven-year-old, in the middle of it all, right in the middle of the story. Look at this next picture. This is her, and if you asked her that night, she would say, I pretty much was the linchpin of this whole entire thing. (laughs) I mean, I don't want to take all the credit, but most of it. Right? That's for another day for her. And here's what we see in this story, and here's what we've been seeing for the past number of years in this church. We participate in the promise. God has an active role for you to play in his inbreaking kingdom. God has a role for you to play. Over the past year of this project, this has been a big project, we've had so many people participating in the promise. And I want to thank a number of people, before I get too far into my sermon, that have They've just, they've participated in so many different ways. I think of the hundreds, hundreds of volunteers. We have, I think, 430 volunteers right now in our church that serve week in and week out. Incredible. There's hundreds of people that are funding this through Never the Same. You'll hear about it more in March. Um, This wasn't free, right? There was no group on for this. And we looked, uh, this wasn't and isn't free, and yet hundreds of people have sacrificially given and are giving to make this entire project happen. And so if that's you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Today means something extra special to you. I know that it does. I think of our local governmental leaders. Mayor Franco has become a friend of mine and his team and his, everything that he's got going on in this community is world class. And so if you see him, give him a high five and thank him for advocating for this project. He and his entire team, this needed to be rezoned. Uh, This is in a pretty good location if you haven't been able to tell yet. And we shared the vision and in many ways we're partnering with him and his vision to make Bloomingdale even a better place to be. And so thanks, a huge thanks to him and his team. Uh, The Solomon Foundation, they loaned us a lot of money and we're really glad. (laughs) That's really good. So if they're watching, thank you and we're gonna need more soon. Um, (laughs) Kidding, not kidding. Um, (laughs) So many contractors. Uh, I think of Laura and Laura. I think they're both in here. They designed, Laura and Laura designed every square inch of this building. 
And I, you guys are amazing wherever you're at. Thank you so much. Just incredible. Uh, the Drolly family, they did all the bathrooms and all the countertops. Uh, they gave us a deal on that if you're wondering if we overspent. Uh, Mark Bradley and the internet, it works. That's awesome. Uh, Don Mascari, he painted everything. He and his team have lived here for six months. They haven't seen their families. Thank you, Don. Jason's been our superintendent. Thank you, Jason. ANA Paving has paved uh, a number of parts of the parking lot, and we have more for you to do, ANA. So thank you, Todd, and your team for what you've done. There you are, Todd. Love you, brother. One of my best friends. Thank you, Todd. But there's, there's, there's two more that I, I want to thank, and we need to thank. Um, they share the same last name and first name. It's Tom Sr. and Tom Jr., this is Tom Sr. He's been in the steel industry for a really long time. And Tom Sr., I want you to hear from my heart. You already know it's true. We could not have done this without you. I mean, we really would not have been able to do this without you. And just the timing of, of God, you know, just sending you to be part of this community. It's such a perfect time for you to jump in with both feet to, to help with this project. And Tommy Bowman, he's our executive pastor. Um, he's also a Haynes model. Uh, and, um, <laughs> he's not. He's not really. He's not really sorry. See, I need to stick to my script here. I'm getting in trouble for that. Um, where, is, where are you? Where is Tommy? So this guy has, he has led this entire project. People have asked me, John, why do you look so energized? Well, it's because he's been doing all the work. And it's important, Mission, it's important for us to thank him and honor him for all his work. Great job. Thank you, man. Thank you so much. Great job. Uh, a good question would be, well, well, what kind of building is this? And there's so many of you visiting today, and so I just want to kind of get right to some vision. What you're in right now, I know it's a building, but this is an aircraft carrier. Let, let me explain what I mean by that. A church is, uh, they're usually one of three kinds of things. They're either a cruise ship, meaning you come and you enjoy it as long as it's entertaining. I've been on one of those right? Uh, it's a battleship, meaning like we're on mission, but just a few people are doing the work. It's really about a couple personalities. The, the third option is an aircraft carrier, which means this, is that not only have you been saved by Jesus Christ, you can also be sent by Jesus Christ. And so you just got to understand the kind of church that you're in right now. This is an aircraft carrier. This is the kind of building that we've built. Today isn't my vision, I'm excited, but when I start attempting backflips is when you get launched out of here on mission where you bring the love of Jesus to the workplace, to the school, to the classroom, to your family, where you're part of missional communities. That's it. That's it for us. This is an aircraft carrier kind of church. We want to launch you. We want to equip you. This Tuesday and Wednesday night is the start of our winter growth track, steps one through four. We have over 350 people on our growth track this winter term. Why would they do that? They're doing that because they want to grow intentionally. You can start at step one with Alpha. I'd recommend that you do. A whole bunch of you, if you're from another church and you're checking out this church, please start on step two. You will understand the DNA and culture and direction that we're heading as a church. The rest of us, step three and four, and eventually you're going to lead or join a missional community. It's really important for you to know that this is an aircraft carrier kind of church. We'll continue in the story in verse 3. It says, March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests, seven priests, carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. Now, I want you to put yourself in the shoes of one of those seven priests. All right, this is in Jericho. God already told Joshua, inside the walls are fighting men. I just think that's an important detail. They're not passive. They're not neutral. They want to kill you. Jericho is not a safe place, right? The Canaanites, vicious people. And if you're one of those priests, I want you to imagine this moment. Here you are. You're walking out to the line. Joshua comes out. He's like, all right, I got the download from God. Here's how this is going to go down. And he starts handing out weaponry to all the other guys. He gives them grenades and nunchucks and swords and spears. And then he comes to you, one of the seven priests, and he hands you a trumpet. <laughs> like, 
what am I going to do with this? When, when they start wanting to attack me, what, am I going to blow at them? Like, what am I, am I, what am I going to do with this, with this horn? I mean, they're packing horns, not heat, right? So <laughs> this is just funny to me, okay? When my girls are in college, something I will never say to them is, listen, girls, late at night when you're walking home from studying, which they're going to be more like their mom than they were like their dad when they go to college. When you're walking home late at night, I want you to leave the pepper spray at home, but remember the trumpet, right? I mean, who's thinking of trumpet? Do you have a concealed carry for your trumpet? No, I mean, who's thinking about this, right? I mean, if you're one of the priests, think of how vulnerable you must have felt carrying a trumpet around these walls. But here's what they knew. Protection is found in God's presence. Protection is found in God's presence. Those seven priests knew something that I hope you would know and that I would know in increasing measure the safest place I can possibly be is the closest I can possibly be in the presence of God. You see, the most important part of the detail of the story is the ark. Is the ark. If Joshua would have left out the ark, the walls would still be standing. In the ark was the presence of God. And these priests, they knew As long as we're proximate to that, as long as God, the ark, has our back, hand me the trumpet. I'm going to start walking. Protection is found in the presence of God. There's been some moments over the past, definitely seven and a half years, but over the past year where I have felt vulnerable. You know, it's a feeling that men love to feel. It's one of our favorites, actually. Um... One of those moments was when I I came to the building and we didn't have a roof. And so I I brought a picture. This was one of those moments. Um, There used to be these big steel columns in here and we we thought you'd prefer to not look around a pole to experience this, so we removed them. And I showed up and we didn't have a a roof. And and I don't know anything about construction. All all I know about construction is how to drink coffee. That's that's the only thing I'm good at. And so, thank you, Mama March. Thank you. And, And so... I show up and I'm freaking out because I'm like, do they know what they're doing? Do we have, like, how do, these, how, do, how do we decide on these guys? Tommy, did, they, I don't know if they measured that. Like, here it is. It's going to be the front page of the paper. John ruins everything. The, the church collapses before it's even built, right? I mean, there's been moments. This is just one of them. There have been so many moments in this project where I've felt like a priest carrying a trumpet. But what God's been teaching me is that my protection is found in his presence. There's been more moments in this very space, at night, after hours, unfinished room, where I would just walk in here. And this sounds weird, I know it, I know it. But I would walk in here on the concrete, and I'd start singing to God. He doesn't care about pitch. I'd just start singing to him. Why? Because I have felt some pressure. I felt vulnerable. But I have needed the protection of his peace. And here's the thing, some of you, you aren't building a building like this in the next 12 months, but there is a project, there is a thing, there is a relationship, there is pressure. My question to you is, are you running towards the presence of God? My question to you is, what are you going to do to get as proximate as you can to God himself? I know to my core that when you do, you're going to feel peace. You're going to feel peace. His protection. It was in the New Testament with Jesus, with his guys, his disciples. They were out in a boat and a storm came upon them. Maybe you've heard this story. Uh, The disciples did what we would do. They absolutely freak out because the storm was significant. Uh, Jesus, not so much. He was taking a nap in the base of the boat. Uh, Finally, they wake up Jesus and say, I hope you had a good dream, but we've got an issue upstairs. And so Jesus comes upstairs and he kind of wipes the sleep out of his eyes. His hair is all disheveled and he looks at the storm and he looks at them and he looks at the storm. They're freaking out and he's like, peace, be still. And the storm obeys him. That's my king. So, so what I'm getting better at is I'm going downstairs sooner. I'm going downstairs quicker. Because here's, here's me. I'm just going to stay up there and try to be strong and try to fight this storm. No, no, I'm going to hang in there. All the while, the king of kings, the, the one who the storms obey, is on boat with me. I'm just going downstairs sooner. 
I'm going downstairs sooner. And I'm saying, Jesus, we got a situation upstairs that only you can handle. I need the protection of your peace. This is what God is teaching us. This is what he's teaching me. We participate in the promise. Protection is found in God's presence. The story continues. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. Look at this next part. On the seventh day. On what day? Say it with me. On the seventh. Yeah, the seventh day. March around the city. How many times? Yes, yeah, seven times. With the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear the sound of the long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse. And the army will go up. Everyone straight in. This next point is why I think many of you came today, and here it is. Don't stop on six. Don't stop on six. You you just can't stop on six. You cannot pull up short. He he did not say six or five or or four. He said seven. It was three years ago that I heard this one statement. Don't stop on six from the pastor of Elevation Church. I want to give him credit for it. And I'm sitting there watching YouTube, and that statement, it just impacted me. There have been so many moments in my life in the course of the past eight plus years of leading this church where I've I've been so tempted to stop on six. Why are the walls still up there? My feet hurt. I'm just walking in the same direction, lap after lap after lap. Talk about the boredom. When are the walls going to fall? Jesus, I want you to move. I want you to do something. And what God has been teaching me is about an obedience, a long obedience in the same direction. You want to know what Christianity is about? That's one of the main things it's about. It is a long obedience in the same direction. Don't stop on six. Don't pull up short. You cannot quit. The one who saved you is a finisher himself. And the finisher has poured his spirit into your heart. It will give you a spirit to finish, to keep walking. I don't know what the walls are in your life. I don't. But there are walls. Some of you, it's, it's marital walls. Man, you... Right after the last service, a lady in the, in the lobby, her first time to mission, just bawling. She's like, you have no idea how bad I needed that. She's like, the only change you can make, which has been a few suggestions in the past few weeks, the only change you can make is just, I need more Kleenex in front of me. She's like, as you were talking about that, that so many marriages right now in this room are on the rocks. And you made a promise to God and to her or to him, and you are so tempted to pull up short, you cannot stop on six. You can't. No, you, you can't. You can't pull up short. Some of you, God has given you a dream. It's to start or to lead a business, and it is in your heart. And it is harder than you ever anticipated. And the walls are still there. I get it. I get it. And right now, you're vulnerable, and you want to pull up short. You cannot stop on six. Some of you teachers... I think you play the most important role in society. You get to invest in the next generation and you, you fill local schools in this community. You're doing a great work and those students, man, they are not as far as long as you wish they were. <laughs> and you want to pull up short. Don't stop on six. Some of us, we pray in this community. We walk around schools, or around parks, and we say, God, we want heaven here in this community and all the communities around us Mission, my question to you is, are you getting weary? We cannot stop walking. We cannot pull up short. We cannot stop on six. It was January 8th, 2010. I'm in my office at Willow Creek Community Church. I worked there for a while, great church up the road. And my wife, Kelly, in the first row, we've been praying for a number of months about whether to start this church Back in, way back in 2004, God spoke to me about this. I knew I had to start this church in my hometown. I had to, just had to do it, me and Tommy and Jot and, our, and, our, and our, our friends. But we've been praying now for a number of months with our mentors and so many people. And it was on January 8th, 2010, that God said, go. He said, go. 
This past week, I've been reliving that moment. I remember picking up the phone. I called my brother Justin first. I mean, that's a a fumble from a marriage standpoint. I should have called Kelly first, I know. But Justin makes a lot more money than Kelly, and I needed to make sure he was in before Kelly. And Jot's like, man, we've been dreaming about this forever. Let's go, I'm with you. And I called Kelly. And, and Kelly's like, I have peace. I'm like, you do? See, she's the break in our marriage. I'm the gas, which me is code for she's really wise and I can be a complete idiot. <laughs> and so when she didn't hit the break and she's like, I have peace, I'm like, this is true. It is time to go. Isn't it amazing all that God has done since that moment? Man. And um, you can mistake this for an overnight success. It just isn't. It's been a long obedience in the same direction. You can also mistake this as one guy doing this, and that would be a huge mistake. I'm one person in a long line of a huge community that have been walking around the same walls. Amen. Long obedience in the same direction, wanting to redefine church in our lifetime in the 10 and beyond. We've been learning that as we walk, God works. I've walked hundreds of laps around buildings in this community over the years. Hundreds. And I'd, I'd pray, I know what else to do. I'm like, well, it's in the Bible. Well, I guess I'll do that. And I would walk. I could tell you the buildings if you're interested. And I would sing. And people would think I'm crazy because I am. And I've walked so many laps around this building when it was still a lazy boy. And just would walk around. And I didn't know if God was working. But we've learned that as we walk, God works. I don't know what your walls are, but maybe you're here this morning to hear this word. Don't stop on six. You, you, you can't pull up short. Hundreds of years after this, after this moment, hundreds and hundreds of years down the road, Hebrews 11.30, this is said of this community. Amazing. Hebrews 11, if you start reading the Bible, Hebrews 11 is the, the hall of faith chapter. Like, if you make it in Hebrews 11, like, you got some serious faith, okay? And this community was, is part of this chapter. It's really cool. They're in the hall of faith. Hebrews 11.30, look what it says. It says, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell. This is important. It wasn't by trying hard. It was by faith. I've been asking God, how? How did they have this kind of faith to not stop on six? How did they have this kind of faith to have this kind of fast obedience? Joshua says, here's what we're gonna do. They're like, let's roll. How did they have this kind of faith? How did they do it? And what God reminded me of in their story is this wasn't the first thing. In fact, in chapter three, three chapters earlier, they come up, to a very difficult situation. It was the Jordan River in flood stage. And God says to them something just as crazy. Uh, cross it. We're going to die. I'll handle it. And so they step into the river and it's parted. And they walk across on dry ground. You see, we then get to chapter 6 and they're walking around the walls of Jericho. And we think they're looking at the walls, but they're not. They're turning around and they're looking back at the river. And some of you, you're circling but you're just looking in the wrong direction. You're looking at the walls that haven't fallen, but today God is saying, no, no, you gotta turn around and you gotta look back at the river. You gotta look back at all the moments I've come through in the clutch. You gotta look back and look at your past that is littered with my faithfulness. You think it's up to you, it's not up to you. No, you gotta look at the river. You gotta look back. This is how faith is built. It's the power of hindsight and the goodness and faithfulness of God. Would you look back as we move forward as a church? We put together a little video that I thought would help us look back at some of our river moments as we move forward as a church. Hannah said perfectly, we're not done. We're not even looking at the break. The gas is all the way down. We're not easing up. We're moving forward, but as we move forward, we're gonna look back. Let me pray, God, thank you. And I pray, God, that you'd use this video to remind us of all that you've done, all that you've accomplished. 
We love you, Jesus. This is your day. May you get the spotlight and the credit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.